This is outlined in much further detail in the report. Uh, one of the two studies you did find here at the beginning of the session, and which are on our website, uh, about, about the issue. But I'll summarize some of the main points here. The, um, the basic um, story, if you will, of the advancement of continental trade, essentially of reviving the land route, trade, land route trade across, uh, across Eurasia, um, started with an EU initiative, the Traseca Initiative, which stands for Transport Corridor Europe Caucasus Asia. And it is interesting that when we talk about this issue today, uh, the EU's role has faded into more or less oblivion, in spite of some revival to some extent of this initiative in, in the very recent past. Uh, in fact, what we've seen is the uh, introduction of other initiatives by outsiders. The uh, two primary ones are by the US and by China. The New Silk Road initiative uh, that the US uh, launched uh, uh, was one. Uh, as Vlad uh, mentioned, it was never followed up by serious money, but there was another problem, which is that it was never followed up by a serious presidential endorsement. Uh, it was uh, mentioned by Secretary of State Clinton. It was launched in a logic that was a north-south logic, primarily a logic of connecting Central Asia with South Asia. It was announced in Mumbai, not in Central Asia or in anywhere to the west. And it was basically in an Afghanistan-centric, if you will, initiative that was part of the U.S.-Afghanistan strategy. Now that is quite significant and paradoxical, especially because the United States uh, for 25 years was the leader of the idea of the East-West Corridor that would bring, uh, that, that would connect uh, Europe with uh, Central Asia across the Caspian and the South Caucasus. Uh, so in a way you could say that this was a form of strategic myopia as a part of the, above, of the Clinton State Department, I should say, uh, that it could go, for example, the South Caucasus countries were initially left out of the New Silk Road Initiative, in spite of all the pre-existing investment of the United States into the East-West strategy. Now this shows you the lack of strategic vision behind this, behind this initiative, uh, but also the fact that it never, the President Obama has never mentioned it, the National Security Council has never discussed or endorsed it in, in any form of public way, which means that if you are in Central Asia, the lack of a top-level endorsement means that it's difficult to really take this initiative very seriously. Uh, in fact, I think it's very clear that the, um, the Chinese did exactly the opposite. Uh, not launching an initiative that wasn't followed up by concrete action, but by bundling the existing initiatives spread out and uh, isolated initiatives that China was already pursuing or planning into a coherent, uh, into a coherent strategy called the New South Silk Road Economic Belt which of course itself is part of the even broader uh, idea of the One Belt, One Road Initiative. Uh, as well, again mentioned, the China, and as was mentioned by other speakers, the Chinese presence in the region is very concrete. The uh, Chinese president spent a week touring Central Asia, uh, which is very much unlike what Western leaders, uh, any Western leader has done, of course. Uh, now, those are the initiatives from the outside, if you will. Uh, but I think the uh, equally important that as the outside initiatives are the initiatives arising from inside uh, not only Central Asia but inside the East-West Corridor because after all the main direction of trade that we're talking about which makes the continental transport uh, viable is the uh, booming trade between Europe and the edges of the Eurasian continent if you will, Western Europe and, and East Asia between the EU and China. And you see a number of examples of, this, uh, of these initiatives arising from within the region. Uh, sometimes unilaterally within individual countries, sometimes cooperative ventures between two or three countries. So Kazakhstan alone has built about 2,000 kilometers of, uh, of railroad, including a uh, new railroad construction that cut the uh, distance between China and the EU by 1,000 kilometers, which is a significant which is a significant distance in most countries, uh, not as significant in the large territory of Kazakhstan, it would be most elsewhere, but still. Uh, Uzbekistan, uh, which is not usually seen as being very cooperative in these issues, has, uh, has built 500 kilometers of railroad in the past decade or so. Uh, more importantly, if you look further to the west, you see the development of large port infrastructure in the Caspian, which to a certain extent addresses the issue that uh, Mr. Emerson raised about Iran. 
certainly the Iran vector, the, the Iranian transit route would be a, a, a viable one and, and, and a good addition to the existing routes. But the fact is that if you take together the port of Akhtar in Kazakhstan, the renewed port of Turkmenbashi uh, in Turkmenistan, and the new port of Alak south of Baku, uh, in which billions and billions have been invested, you have the, uh, the development of quite sophisticated port infrastructure making transit across the Caspian Sea uh, um, but one of the least of the problems, if you will, of the development of this East Coast Corridor. To the West, uh, you had the problem, and you still actually have the problem, that there is no rail connection connecting the western shores of the Caspian into the European Union. And in fact, there are two missing links. One of the missing links is under the Bosporus, because Turkey has two rail networks, one in Europe, Europe, on the European side, and you have to take a boat over to the Asian side if you want to proceed by rail. The Marmaray project is gradually addressing that. And most importantly, you have also the Baku Tbilisi Cars uh, railway project, which is scheduled to be completed this year, which will fill the missing link uh, that would connect uh, the Caspian with Europe. So therefore, what you're seeing being developed uh, across this region, mainly by the initiative of the countries themselves, sometimes with foreign support, but very often without any type of external support, is the actual building of the hard infrastructure that will lead to uh, a viable railroad transportation network across, across Eurasia. Now, if we look at uh, the emerging reality of trade, of course, you see that the, the numbers for this, uh, this type of trade, is, the potential numbers are very, and the logic for this are quite compelling. Uh, obviously, uh, trade between the EU and China has doubled for the past uh, decade or more. Uh, of course, over a little more than a decade. And even in spite of some slowdown in economies, it's likely that this trade will grow, not at the dramatic pace that it has recently, but certainly it will not, it's unlikely to diminish. The, uh, if one looks at the, uh, at the way that these goods are being transported, it depends a little bit if you count by value or by volume. Uh, by value, about 20% is flown by air. Um, by volume, it's close to 10%. Uh, whereas much of the remainder, the great majority, is used by sea lanes. Now, sea lanes, of course, which means essentially transiting the Suez Canal, is uh, not expensive. Uh, there is uh, plenty of volume, actually, free space in the, uh, in the in container trade in, in, in the sea lanes, but it's very slow. Whereas, of course, air is, is the opposite. Air is very quick, but it's also extremely expensive. Which means that for a number of uh, for a number of goods, the logic of a, a of a land route, which could be anywhere from 11 to 14 days between China uh, and uh, European destinations, uh, at a cost that is slightly uh, somewhat more expensive uh, than the sea route, but much much cheaper than air, makes a lot of sense. You see examples of this, and in fact, one of the reasons why Kazakhstan embraced the idea of the Eurasian Economic Union is that through Belarus, Russia, Kazakhstan, you would be able to have a single, uh, you know, uh, a single border crossing, um, actually two border crossings only between China and the, European, and the European Union, and this is used, among other, the most celebrated example is HP computers that arrived in Duisburg, uh, if I'm not mistaken, in, in Germany, uh, by, produced in China. By now, the, um, the issue right now, I think, is that we see a lot of hard infrastructure being developed. We see a potential for this, uh, for the, for, for, and a logic for this trade route to be, to be completed. However, we don't. We we have the, uh, the, if you will, in the study, take issue with the old adage that if you build a road, people will use it. In fact, you may build a road, but people may be just as likely not to use it and continue to use air or to use trade uh, or to use uh, sea routes. And in fact, what we see is that what is missing to take this, to realize this project, to take it to the next level, uh, are, are several things, and one of the main ones is the, the shift of focus, if you will, from a focus on hard infrastructure, uh, and from government, actually from government-driven initiatives, to a, uh, to a focus that will look at what market actors will be interested in, which means governments can fund railroads, governments can build highways, uh, but at the end of the day, there has to be a market logic for why. Uh, a private investor would like to use, or a private shipping company would like to use a certain trade route. And that is something that is not sufficiently uh, developed. Among other, you have problems with border crossings, the insecurity of how long you have to wait for a certain border uh, is, is, is an issue that, that where much needs to be done. 
Uh, a second and related issue to that is to the issue of soft infrastructure, namely that upon the building of hard infrastructure, you still have the need for uh, logistical hubs to be established along this very long net. We've talked recently about today about two. One, Kazakhstan has the potential to be one. Georgia is emerging as a potential for another uh, logistic hub further to the west, and that is what uh, already the Chinese are showing interest in. So what does soft infrastructure mean? It really means that the uh, traded, trading routes will develop depending on the existence of, uh, uh, of uh, shipping centers, storage centers, insurance centers, even uh, features such as the quality of hotels and the quality of the support infrastructure for trade and for logistics that exist in a given country or region. So, from a European perspective, our point is that uh, at this point, for the European Union to continue to revive and to help revive and to retake the initiative, if you will, in this area, uh, it, is, uh, it makes a very strong sense to, as a pilot project, if you will, to take the initiative of supporting the development of this type of soft infrastructure and a logistics hub in Kazakhstan. And that is for, for three reasons. Number one, the geographical one, that if, since this trade remains dominated by the EU and China, well, once you've crossed the Caspian or once you've crossed Russian territory, uh, there is uh, there's just one country in between if you use Kazakh uh, territory, which is, of course, for all practical purposes, an advantage. The second one is that whereas uh, for much of this, this trade, if you look at um, Trans-Caspian trade, Turkmenistan may be an important country, Uzbekistan, because it borders every other country in Central Asia also. But the fact is that both in terms of the rankings of doing business, Kazakhstan is the only country that both has a geographical advantage and is positioned in such a way that it could provide the, uh, the support of the re regulatory environment for, a, for the type of logistic hub that we are talking about. Uh, we see, for example, the idea of, uh, you know, after the Expo 2017, what will be done with this enormous uh, site. Uh, the idea of the Astana International Financial Center, modeled on the Dubai example, which would have extraterritorial uh, elements such as uh, a British-based arbitration system and other ideas that could be very much applied to the area of transport and trade and make um, and, and provide uh, advantages for shipping companies that would like to, to base themselves in this in this in this region. The um, the third point, uh, aside from the transition from government to market and from the and the issue of uh, hard to soft infrastructure, uh, we view it is actually simply put the geopolitics of trade. And the geopolitics of trade could be summarized as follows: Let nobody have uh, a um, stranglehold on the trade routes. Now, of course, this was the logic behind the multiple pipeline strategy of the 1990s, which was very successful. Uh, it was mentioned, I can't remember by, I think I was here, but it didn't probably, that the uh, Caspian Pipeline Consortium, the Tengiz Novorossiysk Pipeline, is the only private pipeline in Russia. This was a Western initiative. This was a US-led initiative, in fact. We often see the US pipeline policy is very often seen as being anti-Russian. We should remember that the first pipeline that the US supported and completed was a pipeline that only crossed Russian territory. So in fact, what is more correct is to say that this is an anti-monopolistic policy. The uh, pipeline policy was designed for no power, especially not a former colonial overlord, to have any form of stranglehold over the export of the most valuable resources of these countries. Si similarly, in the, trans in the transport and trade sector of conventional goods, it will make sense for everybody, and it is in nobody's interest, that one country, whether it be Russia or anybody else, have a monopoly over the trade route. Uh, one example that we point to is the fact that when Russia, when the trade between China and Europe was developing, the Russian, it, the Russian uh, preference initially was for the direct northern route to go from China directly into Russia and over Russian territory into Europe without crossing through Kazakhstan, only because of the Chinese determination that this would actually go through Kazakhstan uh, was that, did that become the main so that gives us uh, pause for thought and suggests that, well, so what does this mean in practice? In practice, uh, preventing the domination of any single country over the trade routes means investing more, committing more to the trans Caucasus transportation corridor. It is in the Chinese and the European as well and as in Kazakhstan's interest that this become a viable trade route exactly on the same, at par, not instead of, but at par with the existing trade routes. 
Finally, uh, we, uh, we look also to the future and um, note the fact that in much of the discussion about the trade between Europe and Asia, it is very China-centric. Now, in the report, we have a number of statistics about the role of the Asian subcontinent in this trade, and it is minor. Uh, if you look at the trade between India, hardly, it's hardly visible on some of the graphs. Uh, now, that is partly because if you are in Central Asia, it's difficult to get to India. You have the Afghanistan problem, and every other trade route is very complicated. But if you look 30, 40 years into the, into the, uh, into the future, you have to consider the fact that, if nothing else, because of simple demographic reasons, China is going to stagnate. Whereas the simple demographic makeup of the Indian subcontinent means that you have a market there that is going to be considerably larger uh, than the Chinese market. And therefore, it stands to reason that just the same way as China has emerged as a major trading partner to Europe in the past 15 to 20 years, it is very likely uh, in spite of the Afghanistan problem, in spite of the India-Pakistan differences, that the mm -hmm. Indian subcontinent as a whole will emerge as a, could emerge as an equally, if not more significant, trading partner to Europe. And therefore, uh, it's time to think about these things now, if not nothing else, for the fact that if you look at the evolution, the, the, the realization of a land trade route between China and Europe, well, the initiatives for that were laid at the beginning of the 1990s, 20 to 25 years ago. If we want a similar type of uh, trade routes between China, uh, between Indian subcontinent and Europe, we have to start thinking about it today. Even though the political problems that exist in the region may appear to be very daunting. Um, now, in closing, I think the, this is a, mainly an economic issue, a trade issue, but it has enormous implications for security and sovereignty. Namely, that currently, who is interested in the maintenance of the sovereignty of the countries of Central Asia and the Caucasus, well, there are some, aside from the countries themselves, there are some defense planners in the United States, there are some political leaders in Europe and the US who view, and in China at least, who view this as an important political issue. But the point is that once you have a major artery of trade between Europe and Asia transiting this territory, the rationale from also a private sector perspective for the uh, sovereign, for the maintenance of sovereign sovereignty and stability, and for drive for political reform across this territory, will be mounting. Just as nobody wants to mess with the Suez Canal, and nobody would want to mess with the uh, sovereignty of the countries of Central Asia, and especially Kazakhstan, if a major trade route between Europe and Asia goes through this territory. That I think would uh, summarize our main. Memory.